So stuff like that that we had planned that no one knows about except just listening now, I guess, to us talking about. This is Commentary on Commentary, a series in which I take DVD commentary tracks and cut them down to a best of list that includes Easter eggs, movie trivia, filmmaking tips, and much more. I'm your host, Kenneth Arthur, and today's facts are about Final Destination, a movie that came out in 2000 and changed the horror genre with Rube Goldberg-style deaths delivered by Kill itself. I mean, kills delivered by death itself. The original Final Destination DVD has three separate commentary tracks, but the one I'm going to be reviewing today has co-writers and directors Glenn Morgan and James Wong, two alumni of the X-Files writer's room, Jeffrey Reddick, who originally wrote an X-Files spec script that became Final Destination, and editor James Koblenz. I'll be putting their names in the list every now and then just to remind you who's who. But most of what you'll hear is Morgan and Wong, who packed their feature film debut with facts you wouldn't have ever known about if not for the commentary track, such as fighting for a different title, why they cut out a major pregnancy plot point, and fake pee. So let's get to it. Here are 127 facts about Final Destination as told to you by the people who made it. Uh, the, the title Final Destination, uh, we didn't want, we wanted the movie to be called Flight 180 at the last minute. So uh, uh, New Line was concerned that it might seem like it was an Airport 77 or Air Force One type uh, turbulence disaster movie. We fought it and, and lost. You'll see a lot of stuff that's kind of related to 180. I mean, I wrote an X-Files spec script with this concept inside of it. In this bedroom, Devin had to pretend to be sleeping in the next scene coming up, when in fact, he actually fell asleep for a good four hours. <laughs> we couldn't wake him up. The particular shot that showed the clock changed to flight 180, it's changed to 180. It took us literally, I think, five different days of shooting it to make it work. And we had written a lot of kind of a, I wouldn't call it an inside joke, but kind of nods to great horror filmmakers of the past. This is Mr. Murnau, who did a, directed Nosferatu. Todd Wagner and his brothers, George sure. Wagner. George Wagner directed uh, The Wolfman. Devin's character, is, his, na his last name is Browning. And of course, yeah. he did Dracula and Freaks. And uh, this is Clear Rivers, who is named uh, not after a famous director, but actually our assistant, whose name is Clear. Uh, Kristen here, uh, she's Val Luton, and he produced uh, Curse of the Cat People and Cat People. People think it's weird because Kristen and I are married. In the X-Files script, the character that I had had the premonition was um, Scully's brother Charles, who was like the brother that we never really see anything of. Um, but then Scream was out, and you know, the, we all, all talked about it, and you know, we kind of had to give in a little bit. And we're like, okay, let's make them teenagers, but we'll make them smart teenagers. So this is a CGI effect. In the background, there's all murals. All those murals are a different ways that people are going to die. They have something to do with uh, what's going to happen. See, the background of the picture next to her is a bus, and she will be, uh, her demise will, will come from a bus. It's a model. Uh, now, this kind of bit with a John Denver happened to me at the Vancouver airport when I was working on Millennium. I was about to board a plane, but John Denver came over the PA, and it was just a few weeks after he had died, and the plane crashed. So, gate 46, that's the number of kids that were... Uh, number of victims class. in the class. Yeah. You look very closely, you see their heads are coming very close to the top of the ceiling because uh, we did a forced perspective set earlier in the scene when the two girls were walking down the way. There's a man walking down way into the gangway and that person was actually a little person. He was only like four feet high. The guy who was driving the luggage cart there was a the production designer, John Willett. And if you notice, the card also had 666 six, 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 six. on it. Billy was the first, like, you know, I think the kind of chubby nerd guy. And uh, casting Sean, I think, was a good thing because it took away from that cliche. I mean, for the lead of Alex, I actually really wanted to get Tobey Maguire for Alex. Um, and in my draft, they were actually two sisters. And this is totally me being, I guess, a studio head, too, but I actually wanted to get um, Brandy. Um, and I wanted to get Kirsten Dunst for the role of Kimberly, a.k.a. Clear Now. That's Randy Stone, who we've worked with. He casts X-Files. He threw that radio, and that was the first take. He knocked Chad on the head there. When they get off the plane here, the murals are all in a different position than what right. they were prior to boarding the yeah, plane. That right. After the characters had cheated death, that everything was skewed. When he came into audition, he was the only one that understood all the, who got the inside jokes about the names, and I had little resin models of uh, Bride of Frankenstein and Phantom of the Opera. And he was all, oh, I'm all into that. 
So he said, we have to cast that guy because he's a horror movie fan. Um, at first we had a slasher killer, and then we decided we didn't want to have that. We wanted to have death itself. And we personified it the first time, but then we decided that that was a little hokey too. So we went back and really made death more of a, of a presence. Uh, upcoming, there's a song that's going to be starting right now, I think. And that song was written by uh, our assistant's husband. Yeah, we wanted to use Long Long May You Run by Neil Young, but it was like a quarter of a million dollars. I think this is Kerr Smith. He's you know known for his part on Dawson's Creek, but he did a really good job on this part. I, it took my time. Uh, this is actually, this. I got a 70 on my driver's test. <laughs> and the guy said, you're going to die at a young age. And that was another thing Brian Witt said. That was a note. No one gets a 70. No one's that bad a driver. And I said, I did. <laughs> there was actually an executive who, when, when we gave him the script, he was on a plane. He was on a flight 180 from Los Angeles to uh, New York. He opened the script and started reading it. And he kind of freaked out. So I helped us get the movie made, by the way. Cynthia Pastor is my mother-in-law. And in the original ending, that picture plays a part in the ending of the movie. Uh, those pictures on the wall were actually uh, stretched and they were taken by the first AD. People actually bring up, why is, what is the deal with the name of the fan? And I think John Mullett just put Typhoon as a play on words. So there's USA Today on the background. They gave us a bad review, so we should have. In the script, there was, he, he did a lot more than just look at the penthouse, but uh, we decided. Not that one. Not, not that much more, but. Himself, right? okay, now this, okay, this floor, it took us three times to do this. The tiles are, you know, skewed. Uh, if you look at the floor, right there, you can kind of see that tile on the lower uh, left-hand corner. But, but, you know, we did 20-some-odd takes of the water flying on the floor, and it still never really went where we wanted it. Uh, hopefully, we're hoping people think here that he's going to get electrocuted. But he saves himself in time. No. This is the only uh, nudity in the show, which, unfortunately, is very, very brief. And what you had to do was get uh, the, the dog off screen to agitate the owl. This actually <laughs> happened to it. We stole this from our friend's life, Joel Soisson, who produced the second Nightmare on Elm Street. We had many versions of this, some excruciatingly long. It was a psycho homage shot. Uh, his eyes are red now. Yeah, uh, Matt Tom just said that is that's what that's what actually would happen. No, oh, that shot I fought to get in there, even though Jim Wong and Jim Collins fought me. <laughs> just thought it added a little creep to it. This is shot in reverse, uh, and then run backwards. I remember we had really real problems with the glare on the uh, corner van. If you look at it, there's just a mass of goo. The leaf falling took us literally half a day. There was a string that was attached to it. If you look at the deleted scene, that's the reason you have the leaf. Right. And the original ending that you'll see in the DVD the versions. Because for all of us, there is that one day. I wish way that dog walks across the screen like I'll kick him or something. Right. Yeah. And you see what Claire has in her hand now. This is you it. never notice, but it's a can of turpentine that will also play at, at in the end of the movie. The springy head guy wasn't in the script. We made it up, including a line where she says, I, I'm not into any of that X-Files bullshit, which <laughs> always got kind of a chuckle. You'll see Devin's face right there. But when he gets out of frame, the stunt guy replaces him. So both of these people are stunt people. You always knew that this was going to work with the audience, too. You kind of sat there and you go, man, everyone's going to freak out in a minute. <laughs> it's a little cheap, so. Hey, it's cheap, but we'll take it. Uh, in the set here, you look down that way, we uh, purposely planned for the basement set not to be um, finished, so it looks like some kind of cave they came out of. We didn't know if he was going to be... It was devil incarnate or death or whatever. This is uh, Tony Todd. Uh, Jim and I wanted to cast in a show that uh, we did a long time ago called The Hundred Lives of Black Jack Savage. Don't ever look for it. I hadn't seen the Candyman movies when we cast him. His character is actually named William Bloodworth. Right. Who is, uh, that's our actual registered pseudonym. Cigarette Smoking Man episode. His pseudonym was uh, Raul Bloodworth. And, uh... I don't know if Tony wants me to tell you this, but he sweats more than anyone I've ever seen in my life. That shirt, we had to, after the first uh, rehearsal, we had to wait 15 minutes for the shirt to dry. We saw his eyes blink, and it was a mistake of ours that we didn't correct. 
which you'll see, which later, uh, there's a crane back there, which is really a cheat for the, for the bus hit because there's no way a bus could get that much velocity going down the street right there. Uh, originally, we had a two-pack, <laughs> If I Die Tonight, which I think kind of worked better, but at the last minute, literally the last minute yeah. of the uh, sound mix, we were told that we couldn't get the rights to them. So we put in a nine-inch nail sounds, which uh, worked okay, I thought. It had the words Final Destination. It did have, yeah. And, and two back songs, but Amanda Detmer plays Terry Chaney, who has Lon Chaney worked with uh, Todd Browning. Uh, what we did is we had two life-size expensive uh, dummies done by, uh, you know, dipping Amanda Detmer in <laughs> plaster. Uh, I think like 50000 each or something. Very expensive. Oh, wow, woo, woo, And then the next day, at Dailies, we were all... Yeah, we were worried. It just that looked like... It didn't look very good. And we were so, ready to reshoot it. When uh, Roger takes Devin and put him, puts him in the car, he does this out of nowhere. Nobody knew he was going to do this. He actually really jammed him into the car. And Devin was as, as surprised as anyone. People, when they see the, the knife block, always go, oh. No, that was a little, kind of a little like she should have known that was dripping. You know what? I'll be quiet. It's a movie. The stained glass window behind her. And it's another one example of the foreshadowing we used in this movie. That was done reverse. Yeah. The thing going the in. The thing going in her neck. These ambers are CGI embers. So we had a, a floor. It's a false floor, and coming up, her body is underneath it, and there's a, you know, kind of a silicone rubber body. The <laughs> neck, when the neck goes a, in, is actually it actually goes into a body. She built her artwork. The metal was made from. She had gone to the beach. Yeah, and, and made her sculpture from debris from the crash, and that's why he's going nice artwork was supposed to be a little tension. Now that shot of Billy, was he actually fell off the bike and was apologizing there, but <laughs> we, we made it part of the film. My assistant up there, uh, Julie Ng, had sent me a cassette. Here's a bunch of songs you might want to use in the movie, and it was on this one of the songs. She gets no money for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a set right now. And the story she's about to tell, I worked on a film called Trick or Treat in North Carolina, and I met a family down there. What Claire says happened to her father is what happened to this family that I knew. When I was 10, my dad went into a 7-Eleven for cigarettes. I guess that he heard someone say, don't turn around. So on reflex, or thinking it was a friend joking, he did. And a guy blew his head off. I hadn't been influenced by any of the plane crashes. Um, unfortunately, there were a couple of reviews that really went bass at the film saying, oh, you know, it's obviously, you know, taking a page from these tragedies and it's really disgusting. And um, the, the project was written long before these crashes occurred. So. There's a New Line guy who wanted us to take out that line about the jets. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> well, you know, when we were making the movie, I thought the jets were going to the Super Bowl. And then on the very first game of the year, uh, Testa Verde went down. And I said, OK, well, we're safe. That joke's safe. Sorry, Jets fans. Uh, our actors threw a lot more uh, Joe Pesci-like language than uh, was in the script. You have to prove this how big your balls are, not now! The reason why we had the elbow gag in there was that uh, actually Sean came onto the set one day and he had a problem with his lip. We thought, well, the perfect way to hide it is if he had some blood coming down uh, the side of his mouth. So that's why we put the elbow gag in there. We used the oldest gag in the, in the world. It was a full-length, huge mirror. That's right. At an angle that the train actually drove through and the way the camera uh, was positioned made it look like it was going right through the camera. Uh, this is a mirror shot. That's, that's a mirror that we used. Right there's another mirror. Now this stuff there, that bit there with uh, the Carter character is wet himself. That was something... New Line said, take out of the script. And then when we got there, uh, Kerr said, how come that's not in the script anymore? I like that. So considering that the executives were 1,200 miles away. Yeah, we put, we put uh, fake pee on him. The clear character uh, took a pregnancy test because they had made love on the beach. And, and uh, you know, test screenings, people started to kind of uh, get very uncomfortable. And you could tell that we were losing them. No more, no more. You're almost there. You're almost there. It had been omitted, but this character had realized that she was pregnant, and now she was going back to look at this picture of her and her dad at the cabin, and we had heard how her dad had died, and that's what had caused her to go out, motivated her to go out to 
Tell the FBI agents we gotta go. Find Alex. On the report about Mrs. Luton's death, you could read it if you... Uh, she survived by her brothers Waldo and Farkas. <laughs> Farkas was a bad guy in a Christmas story. Kristen asked me to change seats. But no, he's saying he didn't move. He didn't see for me. He sat next to Todd, but the plane didn't, didn't take off. So I don't know. This is a little. Well, I bought it completely. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> all these are practicals. They blew up the top of the pole. And... We wanted to do a lot of these effects on a physical. Uh, physical effects because it was if we felt like you know there's been a lot of CGI yeah, lately. And that actual, you know, sparklers I guess you call them, on on the on the wire. There's those Paris Eiffel towers that Willis had. Will it had in there? This dog actually bit Allie a couple of times. The dog was a little bit too amped up. There were two dogs, like a calm dog and right. an amped up dog. The amped up dog. Uh, Two Jim said, you know, we're getting the dog, we're killing the dog, because death is, you know, mean bastard, and uh, they show you how how, show bad, you how bad death is, and everyone said the dog is not dying, and uh, so we bailed on that very early. But so we had the dog, a fake body of the dog, all planned out. And Some of the set, like right here, is actually on stage, where it's only like two feet off the ground. And there's no glass in that window, but she's about to put her elbow through it. There's a turpentine can that we saw her hold earlier. In the old version, which I guess is on another track, he picks up the wire here and, and, dies, and right. dies. Original draft of my script, um, the character of Clear, who was named Kimberly in my script, um, was pregnant. We find out that she's pregnant, so Beth, basically death can't get her at the end of it because she has an innocent soul inside of her. So, you know, we have this really happy ending. We're, we're at the emergency room, and um, she gives birth to a beautiful baby girl, and everybody's like, oh, and there's, like, happy music, and everybody's smiling, and all of a sudden, like, the lights start shaking, and the hospital room starts, you know, trembling, and all of a sudden the, the figure of death comes roaring through the, the doors and races up to her, and the camera goes black. So we don't actually see her get taken but we know that death has basically got her now because the, the innocent soul is out of her. And I, and I hate putting on the six months later. That was something that film school, they said. That's for hacks. And that's that forced perspective again. I love that. You know what I'm saying? And what happened is, uh, you know, the test scores were okay, and uh, New Line said we want a new ending. Jim and I went to the Formosa Cafe on Santa Monica. Had a couple of martinis. Had a couple of Glenn Livets and said, okay, they go to Paris, and... This is it. Um, but it looks pretty good, I think, for if you're not French, I think you'll you'll buy it. This was a controversial shot. You're right, brother. But by the way, it was supposed to be a year later, actually, when we first wrote the new ending. But it was so cold in Victoria that you see everyone's bundled up and you see their breath. And we just thought, well, you can't you can't pretend this is summer. And uh, that's the outfit that uh, you can buy, actually, on the New Line website. But the outfit that Devin's wearing is the one you can buy. We're trying to, uh, to be funny. It was his own version, his own translation of Rocky Mountain High. It's kind of a deer hunter. Yeah. Homage when she drinks the wine on her wedding dress. Coming up, when uh, Carter knocks Alex aside, you have to watch a stuntman in the lower left-hand corner. He really knocked his head on the ground. He's taking the hospital. That's that stuntman man. I had to go to the hospital right there. And there was some controversy over the sign because he wanted to make this ending economical. And they go, oh, you know, like a sign that hangs over a thing. And Jim Long said, no, a big sign. And there's that 180. Right there, bang. So Kerr has to react to uh, nothing. And that's it. And that's it. 127 facts on Final Destination. I think this is a great commentary track, especially from Morgan and Wong, who really showed how much they prefer practical effects over CGI. That's something that continues within the Final Destination franchise, even though Morgan and Wong were replaced by a different writing and directing team in Final Destination 2. 
Don't worry, Morgan and Wong return for Final Destination 3, which is the conclusion of our commentary tracks for Final Destination, since they didn't make one in Final Destination 4 and Final Destination 5. This commentary track is also loaded with Easter eggs and casting decisions and even a little bit on the budget, though I could always use a little bit more on how they spent those dollars. And by having original writer Jeffrey Reddick there, it allowed us to see how much the story changed from what he had written in his original script to the one that Morgan and Wong eventually shot, to how much the story again changed after test audiences showed how much they hated the storyline between Alex and Clear involving a pregnancy. So the point of a test screening is to show it in front of an audience that will be open to the movie because we're all so close to the material. There was a romance between the two lead characters and a very long scene with them on the beach. And that didn't really work. In the original cut of the beach scene, they make love on the beach. We thought the only way you can really cheat death or the only way you can really beat death is to bring a new life into the world. And you got to the pregnancy bit and you could just tell, oops, I lost them. Another fact that I thought was really important in this commentary track was right at the top and how Morgan and Juan wanted to keep the name Flight 180 over Final Destination, and I think that would have been a terrible decision. So in this case, New Line and the production company was actually right. I mean, Flight 180 isn't something you can turn into a franchise. What are you gonna call the sequel? Flight 182 or Flight 181 because that's the next one in sequential order. In fact, you can just add the, and apparently you have a new title. But the Flight 180 doesn't make any sense unless you're going to continue to have movies on a plane. Final Destination is a reference to planes, but we don't really think about it that way anymore. We just think about it as the name of this film franchise. And that's it for commentary on commentary, looking at 127 facts about Final Destination as told to you through the DVD commentary. If you like this video and want to see Final Destination 2, go ahead and subscribe as that'll be the next one on the docket, and many more to come. So please leave your commentary on commentary on commentary in the commentary below. I'm Kenneth Arthur, and this has been Fair Use.